that, Patti just switched on the recording and I guess I'll hand over to you. I wonder if uh, Angela, because of my mistiming, mm -hmm. I haven't printed my notes out. I wonder yeah. if you could present the ODP file I just sent you, and then I'll be able to speak from my notes by looking at the um, slides in a different way. I Do you mean the text file? Did I send you a text file? An the ODP file. The reward system designed to copy. But, but should this be slides? Yes, it's an open source PowerPoint uh, format. Is anyone able to open it? Because I was only able to look at the text. Can't open it with my setup. Oh, that's a shame. Well, I can run it, but um, no worries. Uh, I won't be able to see my notes properly. I could. Uh, what's the file format? I can look in the background. ODP. Yeah. ODP. Let me share it. Give me a second. Yeah, it looks like you should be able to convert it to PDF or PowerPoint or something. And open it so I could share. Yeah, I just um, let me download it again and send uh, I could share mine for now. Okay. Don't know what screen you're looking at. Mm -hmm. We got the right one. Perfect. Okay. We can see it. So find the button. I'll let you know when I have one set up. Okay, there we go. Page one. See? We can see it. Right? Okay. Oh, good. Uh, that's all about me. Uh, I don't know how much of this you covered already. Uh, oh. in, in about 2008, I started work on a Drupal distribution for Let's and for community currencies. And I still maintain that today. It's used by several hundred groups, uh, almost all of whom speak French. And there's a team assembled, self-assembled from the LETS that do the day-to-day -day management while I write the software. Um, in learning about LETS, I also went quite deep into monetary theory uh, because uh, I made the same mistake that happens a lot in blockchain. You see a system that looks like money and you assume that it is money or it could be money. Um, but uh, what I learned about monetary theory was all through the lens of LETS. And that's one reason why I'm so big on the mutual credit model for community currencies, which we won't go into very much this time. Uh, I also worked <coughs> with a, a friend and a professor to make the Money and Society MOOC, which is all about monetary theory. Uh, and it brings quite a quirky and anarchist perspective to um, the multidimensional subject of money. Uh, and then in 2016, I wrote a paper proposing that what we need is a credit commons protocol, which is a way that all different uh, community currencies could uh, trade with each other, but not by issuing tokens, but by granting each other credit. And uh, I, I've never yet participated in a DAO or seen a DAO or seen the user interface for a DAO. I'm not quite sure where it all goes on, but I have traded in altcoins uh, very plentifully. Um, people tell me that DAOs happen in Discord channels. And I wonder what's the connection between the Discord channel and the blockchain. So that's, that's about where I am. I've got a good grasp of what blockchains do apart from uh, what a DAO is. <coughs> um, it seems to me on the subject of what a DAO is that it's um, more of an organization than it is of anything else. And we understand plenty about organizations. If you look in the fields of um, sociology, business studies, even psychology and things like that, Lots of people are writing about organizations and how humans 
cooperate together. Uh, it seems to me that a DAO, therefore, is an organization that uh, does some of its operations, particularly accounting operations, on a blockchain. And it does that uh, not only with the use of tokens like in Bitcoin, but with the, <coughs> sorry, I had to run here and now I'm coughing. <coughs> um, the, the DAO will use not only tokens, but the smart contracts to arrange which accounts tokens will go into under certain uh, circumstances. Um, am I right about that? Would anyone like to uh, further enhance my understanding of a DAO before we go any further? Yeah, add any comments, everyone. Is a DAO uh, accounting oh. system mainly? Would you agree? Oh, I would say accounting and probably also voting happens with tokens. Mm -hmm. Accounting on a shared treasury. Yeah. Anything else you're missing? It's, it's also responsibilities. For example? <coughs> uh, I mean, any system can't run, you know, just pure, purely on, on uh, accounting. There has to be an understanding, you know, a delegation of responsibilities. And uh, the DAO kind of controls the whole, I mean, it creates the boundaries for the, you know, system to operate. Mm -hmm. It's not a pure accounting mechanism. It's it's much more than that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other? Wait, I can't find the mute button because I've got my screen shared. But no, can I, just, yeah, Matt, I, I can I can take over slides now, actually, if you'd okay. like. Okay. Can I add to uh, what was just said? Yes, absolutely. That um, uh, what you described was a normal organization. And what I'm saying is that a few operations take place on the blockchain, but otherwise it's a normal organization where you do have that need to, uh, for example, allocate roles and distribute responsibilities. I, I, I would actually uh, slightly disagree in the sense because uh, this whole area of, you know, this, you know, this community which you're interacting with is the token economics systems. And what it does is in the token mechanism, it actually, uh, it's possible for uh, the system to be incentivized, unlike ever before. I mean, it's uh, what <laughs> the, the parallel which you're, which you're drawing is, is, I mean, is, in actual, is actually, you know, traditional ecosystems, uh, but, uh, which doesn't handle, you know, you know complexity, uh, but token systems can handle complexity. There's a huge difference. Okay, I'll accept that as a clarification. Um, just to finish this slide, I would like to ask another question. Um, given that organizations have been studied for uh, 100 years plus formally in the field of sociology, what the best books that you have read that tell you something about how organizations work uh, pertaining to your work in DAOs. Just looking for some suggestions. I found uh, the theory of the firm and the viable systems model. I don't know much about either of those, but I did really enjoy reinventing organizations and I have had some interactions with Holacracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other recommendations? Uh, I've just shared today Swarm Wise by the founder of the Pirate um, Political Party. I don't know if you've seen it. I mean, the, the person itself might be disputable. The book is pretty interesting in terms of uh, coordination, bottom up organization, and many. DAOs um, applied at least some of the principles there. So this was basically to pull up uh, a political party based on volunteering and volunteers contributions. Yeah. And there's it, another one. About swarming. There was a book about the, written by the Pirate Party. Think like a swarm, something like that. 
Yeah, right. It's this what I mean is called Swarm Wise, but probably okay. it's not the only publication uh, from the Pirate Party on this topic. Then there are others, other recommendations. Governing the Commons from Elinor Ostrom, self managing communities, and the company, a short history of a revolutionary idea, Wildridge uh, from Sitcode. Thanks for the recommendations. And that was the Lessig uh, Law of Cyberspace. Mm -hmm. I'll add it so that we have it in the uh, chat notes. Cyberspace Lessig. Oh, let me check. Yeah, thank you. Maybe you can drop it to the chat if you can yeah, find it. Yeah, yeah, I can. So, oh, shall I move on? Mm -hmm. Next can. slide, please. So I just want to check as well, before we go any further, what are reward systems for? And I'd just like to offer a temporary definition. It's about motivating people within the context of organizations. Once Peter, you define could we it go like to that, the next slide? Is it OK, Peter? So I think I didn't I, want to interrupt. The next one? Yeah. Yeah. This one? No, the next We one. don't see your screen moving. Yeah, probably. Oh. Okay, weird. Oh, yeah. Need to but, go back uh, a bit. This would be the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So once you define reward systems as motivating people within the context of organizations, you find you're, again, in a well-studied field. Um, one name for that field is leadership. And if, <coughs> if you read a lot of the books on uh, leadership, uh, I realized that the subject was all about how to be a good manager and how to motivate employees to do uh, better work and produce better stuff. Uh, and the idea of leadership is a bit misleading because um, a manager, you don't usually outside of business think of managers as leaders. You think of them as people who kind of help organize stuff. Well, I do anyway. Um, and also the field of leadership, because it's developed in a very commercial context, it might not be what we need to be looking at because um, in most of the DAOs, most of the participants are not paid. So you've got this problem of motivating people, but you have to motivate them all the way um, without giving them a basic salary. Am I right about that? <laughs> uh, not necessarily, because you know, a token system can in, uh, you know, incentivize it. Um, but it's not the same as a salary. It's not money. And, and we'll come on to that. Um, very often the tokens don't have the value at the time that they're given. Um, so it's a kind of speculative value. It's not a wage. I mean, I think we shouldn't talk, so my, my thoughts on this is, I mean, maybe it's too limited to think of salaries and wages because uh, on a token level or in, in the reward systems we discussed, at DAOs, we have uh, the opportunity to reward very granular contributions. So it's not, actually it's not um, about rewarding people only, it's about rewarding any kind of value add activities. So my point is that what's happening in a DAO is different to what's happening in a commercial organization mm. because you don't have that underlying salary and you don't have the contract that goes with the salary. Right. Um, and therefore you don't have the commitment to produce a certain quantity of work in the part of the um, contributors. You have to motivate them all the way. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and because it's not like leadership in that way, it's a much less studied field. Um, and I, I wonder if any books at all have been written on how to motivate volunteers in a DAO or even how to motivate volunteers in an ordinary volunteering context. I'm not aware of those as fields. 
Fitco, do you have a comment? Yeah, so I'll say that there's a brief and a very clear distinction between a DAO and a volunteering organization. Like uh, in the latter, that is a volunteering organization, which um, some of us may have worked at, like, like an NGO or something like that. There is no financial incentive. So that boundary is very clear. But there's a social incentive, um, like there can be a cultural incentive based on the value that the contributors provide. But in DAOs, uh, there's a very clear economic incentive along with the rest of the social incentives that someone provides. So um, I wouldn't say that there is no contract. Like in most DAOs today, there's a very clear commitment of how many hours someone puts in for how, many, uh, how much tokens they get. And I agree that the value of the token can be speculative if you compare it with fiat systems, but um, that token can be swapped for that definition of money, uh, which, uh, which the traditional world agrees with. So if the DAO contributor wants to get paid and wants to imagine uh, their world and denominate their world in a fiat system, they are free to do that. But if they value the tokens based on the values of the community, they participate in, they will uh, instead hold the tokens, like hodl most of the tokens for the longer term um, because they believe in the community. And uh, yeah, that's the main difference between a DAO and a volunteering organization. So are you saying that uh, most DAOs are there to create technology that will in turn create money and bring rewards to the wider world and to the contributors? Yes, especially the ones creating public goods like uh, the TEC or the common stack. Uh, like the whole idea is to reward people who are creating uh, these technologies in the native token for that community. Okay, because some of the people in the common stack are talking about DAOs um, more explicitly as volunteer coordinating organizations. But uh, I'll accept that most of them uh, have at least one eye on commerce. Yeah, if, if I could, I, I, I think that is not as clear cut. I think that in in theory, maybe that's that's true, but just figuring out how to like how to reward how much for what is still very much <laughs> a work in progress in DAOs. So I think that it's 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 perhaps kind of like a combination of both. I, I don't necessarily think that it's you know, that it's been solved and now people just join and are, you know, we have clear expectations about how much money they'll make or how many tokens they'll get. It's still evolving. Understood. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> I could go and have a, a good cough while you're doing this brainstorm one. I want you to think about uh, real world organizations and uh, what incentives and motivators they offer their uh, employees or even volunteers. And then I want you to try to categorize them. And uh, we're running five minutes behind now, Angela. So um, hopefully this can be a relatively quick, sketchy exercise. Yeah, no, no problem. I think we are not in a hurry. So um, how, how should we do that? Should we go to breakout spaces? Matthew, what's that? Um, yes, so I'd like people to work in their teams. Okay, so um, I don't know actually, I mean, I think we have 50% of the, of the real teams here today and probably it's not possible uh, that they gather in their original teams, right? Because some okay. might miss their teammates. So I would suggest we just open up breakout rooms. Um, how many, we are 19 people. Let's say we open nine breakout rooms. And you guys, you just choose your breakout room and join with somebody else, at least two people in a room and take a screenshot now from Matthew's slide so that you know what should be the topic of your brainstorm, brainstorm number one. <laughs> I hope you have it. Maybe Peter, I don't know if you can drop the questions to the chat and if they are visible in the breakouts. I can so, put it in the chat and then you copy and paste it before you go in the breakout. Yeah, right. So everyone, please take a screenshot or some somehow capture the brainstorming. 
and then I'll open the breakout rooms. They are now open and you can select for yourself which room to go to and take five minutes to just collect, really brainstorm, don't enter a discussion, just whatever, whatever comes to your mind. Should we have a note taker, do you think? Or would it be better just to, just to talk? We have well, if you come up with here. four categories each, I'll be happy. <laughs> okay. All right, choose your breakout room and collect as many items as possible. A taxonomy of rewards and motivators used by real world organizations. So not DAOs, right, Matthew? Yeah, and money is not a reward and motivator. All right, money doesn't count, guys. Must be something else. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I should clarify, wages don't count. Uh, money can be offered as an extra reward, but I don't think that happens very often. No wages, no salary, other kinds of rewards. Where's the it, meeting room? You should be able to see the breakout rooms now. They just popped up for me. They should pop up. And now you have nine rooms and choose what, whatever you want to. Can you see them? No. Nope. Um, so I think... Let me close and open then. Maybe uh, try okay. to restart. Nine, nine rooms, maybe party, yes. you can do it. Ah, yeah. You should have a pop-up message, join a breakout room. Can you see it? In the chat? Um, uh, in, it in shows up separately. Yeah. No. I don't have one yet. <laughs> okay. It's weird. Um, okay. I, did, I see it. Hmm. Um, um, we could send people to rooms. <clears throat> yeah. Well, Let's why, do that. Why, can you use the, the, the method you normally use? Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, try to pull up. An, can you now see any pop-up message? Yeah, from Angela to everyone. Can you please yeah. join the breakout room? Yeah. Except there's no breakout room. There, try clicking there. the three dots in, in like the Zoom toolbar, maybe. And then click breakout rooms. If you see that, no, I I tried to. We need to stop screen sharing. No. It's weird no. that option is not showing up at all for me. Okay. Then Steve. I yeah maybe Patty, can you send people to a breakout room? Yes. Hmm. Uh, I bet it's in the. Oh now I can. No. Now yeah. do you see? Yeah. Ah good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Okay, we'll we'll call you back once the time is over. Cool. Just choose. Okay, I'm just going to catch my breath as well. All right. Hey, aim to check if you need help to uh, go to a breakout room. Walker, do you need help uh, going to a breakout room? I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. I just okay. wonder why it wasn't visible. Do you have any idea? Maybe. No idea. I, I have a feeling that maybe you created the breakout rooms and I had, I was about to create them and mm -hmm. then you created, I didn't. Ah. 
and I couldn't see as well. So then okay. I had to delete yours and recreate them from scratch. So maybe all right. That. So always assign somebody to run the breakout room yes. so that we don't have this <laughs> overwriting. Okay, all right. Can you take care for it in the background? Yeah? Yes. Because yes. we'll need sure. two, two more rounds of breakout rooms. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. And I think here people can just choose whom to join. Room nine has now six people, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, I think I want to join one of the groups. Yeah, Take you can, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Matthew, all good on your end? <laughs> it's I'll go and join a group. group. Yeah, cool. Uh, quick question, Matthew. So mm -hmm. we'll have two more rounds of these, uh, this break brainstorming um, similarly? Uh, it's three, it's actually. Three in total. No, three or, more. Or three more. Okay, good to know. And then we just open up brainstorming rooms as now, or is there anything different? Um, I was thinking for the brainstorms to be productive, they would take place in the teams that they have, and each okay. team would have different results. Um, mm -hmm. If that's not the case, I'll just have to word the questions differently. Oh, no, no problem. I mean, we could now say, Okay, you always join the same group, right? The same people. Oh yeah, because we we use the results of this one later. Oh but yes. It doesn't have to be rigid. But it it would make sense. We can just provide them some context so they that they understand, and then mm. it's up to them. Good. Okay. Right. Hi, party. So we go Hello. back to English. Hi. Oh, sorry. Just, what language were you speaking? I was attempting my my fantastic German. Like it's not German. <laughs> it's a uh, intermediate. And Patti, you are Brazilian? Or, yes, or Brazilian. So oh, Portuguese geez. and Spanish work, but Germany, no. <laughs> oh, the bigger ones are already over. You were setting up our. Uh, oh, okay. oh right, so okay then uh wait maybe yeah maybe we'll come back here uh okay. not sure if this or was mark we just do freestyle i think there's a lot of stuff like titles and and employer benefits and all this kind of stuff companies offer to people uh, okay <clears throat> Uh, I'm sorry, do you need to know the, the questions from? Yeah, I did take a screenshot of some questions. I was just about to put them uh, in here. Yeah, we're starting. Yeah, I think the setup time was took too long. Yeah, uh, let's memorize this uh, group and this room, which is room seven. Seven, seven. okay. So maybe we'll come back to this. Uh, yeah. Hello, back in the main channel. We'll continue with the discussion. Uh, just a couple of seconds to uh, allow everyone to come back. All right. Should I Good. share again or would we talk more? Matthew? Can we just, um, can people say what some of the more interesting findings were? Mm -hmm. Just for maximum one and a half minutes. Absolutely. Please share your findings. Philip, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, we just uh, we just did a setup on Miro to start to brainstorm. Okay. And then the session was over. Uh, <laughs> but maybe uh, freestyle, I don't know. I would say like uh, traditional companies, they offer kind of titles except for money, you know, like this hierarchies. Uh, maybe that you have like employees working under you. You can pursue your task. It's kind of like power you get. And then you have like employer benefits you know like extra holidays bonuses um insurance in the states mm. that would be the stuff which came up out of my head from yeah. that's interesting about hierarchies because on the one hand it can be offered like people think they're getting power but on the other hand it's also responsibility mm, yeah. yeah yeah it depends on the type if you like to have responsibility or not i guess uh, but but stock options, promotions, health insurance, 
uh, you know, they've got a monetary sort of an equivalence. Mm-hmm. Um, stock options are uh, maybe monetary, but they're not the same as money, not at all. And we'll get on to that. Um, we had a one of our points was um, working for a company that gives you leverage to pursue individual interests. So like expressing yourself or inspiration, following your inspirations, um, aligning the product and service with individual values, stuff like that. And another form of recognition, which we also realize isn't relevant in the DAO space, but getting a nice clean cubicle or a corner office. <laughs> okay, shall we move on? Can we have the screen share, Peter? Yes. Uh, on to slide access. six. I would add any form of access, for example, to information, but also other uh, aspects, membership in some rounds and so on. I think information is probably under undervalued in terms of recognition. Yeah, great point. Okay, so um, I do want to cover the subject of money because it's my subject. But it's also very important to distinguish between these monetary rewards and other kinds of rewards, especially in this context. So in modern societies, uh, we have a very special relationship with money. Um, many of us have complex feelings about it or are even traumatized by it. Um, and one of the features of money is that you can use it in very, very many ways. Um, maybe as a, a motivator or as a reward or, uh, or as a bribe. Um, you can spend it on absolutely anything in the world and give it to anybody. So money is a very, very powerful thing. But at the same time, it's also quite anonymous, like it has no purpose or meaning in itself. The meaning is in all the different things that you can uh, do with it. Um, I want you to consider the difference between the money that you would give to a teenager to wash the car and how that might motivate or reward the teenager and the money that you would give to an adult who is building the car and how that works as a motivator or a reward. Um, the, the money has a very different meaning in each of those contexts. And there, there could be an element of compulsion in each. Uh, for example, you can compel the teenager to wash the car because they live in your house. And then you can give them the money as a reward. And then you can say that the money isn't compelling the teenager to do anything. But at the same time, the money is a, an intimate part of the equation of compelling the teenager. By comparison, when the adult is building the car, the money isn't really a reward if they need the money to live. Um, the adult is forced into the marketplace where they have to get money in order to buy the things that they need to live because they cannot grow them or obtain them in other ways. So in that case, the money isn't really much of a motivator or a reward. It's the, the sustenance of life itself. So you can offer to pay people um, and it immediately puts the job into a transactional contractual realm. And that's because money is uh, a thing that's organized by a country and it's embedded in law. And that means that when you pay someone money to do a job and they don't do the job, you can bring in the courts and force them to give you the money back or to do the job correctly. Uh, so money isn't just a thing that you give to people to compensate them for their lost work. It's embedded in the whole legal and social system. Uh, and that's one thing that makes money very, very different to the tokens that we use. Uh, we touched as well on the idea of 
contracts already. Um, someone said that uh, you can make a contract in a DAO to do some work in exchange for money, but I wonder if that contract is legally binding as it would be if it involved real money. Excuse me, I've just got a cough. Okay. Um, so money is, in all of these cases, it's not what people actually want. Money is the way that you get things that you actually want. And sometimes it's easy to get confused between actually wanting money and actually wanting the things that money can buy. And the same thing goes for tokens. Um, a lot of us can get obsessed about acquiring tokens, um, believing them to be worth money because we need money to buy the things that we want. And in which case the tokens are just one step removed from money. And we don't actually want the tokens. We don't actually want the money. We want the things that the money can buy. So uh, sometimes money can be the best gift or reward or incentive for someone that you don't know because you don't know what they actually want. So you give them money and you give them the power to obtain what they want. But if you do know somebody, it can be insulting to give them money because you're saying to them with the gift of money, I don't know you, I don't know what you want. So there's a kind of appropriateness about when to offer money and when to give money. And uh, my final reflection on this is that um, in the context of a relationship, when people are doing things for each other, you've got this back and forth and you never really have an exact balance. Like in a friendship, you never get to that moment where you say to your friend, well, I've done exactly as much for you as you've done for me. So we'll call it quits and we can end the relationship. Uh, and some commentators have said that uh, friendships persist because you never quite reach that equality. You can't ever say all the different things that I did for you could ever exactly equal all the different things that you did for me. And therefore, we're always somewhat in each other's debt in a relationship. And when you bring money into that kind of relationship, the implication is always that the debt is settled. That's one of the fundamental functions and purposes of money. Even if you look into the anthropological background, the money settles the debt and it closes the relationship. So I just wanted you to be aware of all of that kind of social, con socio, legal, uh, economic context behind um, our ideas about money. Can we go on to the next slide? So I just wanted to tell you about uh, a study that was done about money and incentivizing people. You can look up Dan Pink. He tells a story on YouTube about a study where they gave people a tricky problem now you see the candle and the box of tax and the matches. And they put people in a room with those things. And they said, we want you to put the candle on the wall in a way that the drips will, be, will not hit the table. And you've got to do it as fast as you can. And they gave people, they offered people money for who could do it the fastest. And they discovered that the people who uh, were offered the most money solved the problem the slowest. And this is very, very uh, important in business studies and leadership. Uh, if you want to motivate people, you have to understand that money isn't always the best way, especially for intellectual tasks. If it was a manual task, like piecework in a factory, money will motivate people to go faster although it can, of course, decrease the quality of the work. Was there so, any reason given why the, the more money, uh, the slower the result? 
Um, nothing that I remember. Okay. Um, but the lessons drawn uh, by Dan Pink anyway, were that if you want better performance out of people, you need to uh, emphasize the autonomy they have in the job, the mastery over the job, and the reason for doing the job. Uh, and so there's a, I think that's two different TED Talks by him referenced there, which I should probably paste in the chat and we'll do at the end. Next slide, please. Don, can I ask a question on that one? Yeah. Okay, do you have time? Um, so I'm wondering how, I, I've seen that, that study, right? And uh, it seems, you know, you're trying to isolate a, one thing, right? In the complex human experience that is work, right? By saying, do this without any context, right? Um, and I see people that are extremely good that are that working at, you know, solid companies, it's not the motivator, but it is a motivator, right? So kind of like extracting the, you know, I, I don't know, I, I guess it, it seems to me a, a bit of a leap to, to make that statement without context, right? And trying to isolate it um, like in, you know, in, in a lab. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if you have any, any thoughts about that. I think isolating it in a lab is a very useful experiment, but it, it can't definitively tell you what's happening in the real world. Uh, but there are other studies that talk about the real world impact. And I just highlighted this one mm. because we're not going into depth. Sure. Uh, so other, other studies will tell you about um, salary levels and motivating people uh, to do a better job. And what you find, of course, is that the, the more you inflate their salary, the less each dollar motivates, understandably. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. So um, since the advent of Bitcoin, a lot of people have been talking about uh, Bitcoin and sometimes other tokens as if they were money. And I want to make a very clear distinction about what tokens are and what tokens do compared to what money as we know it is and what it does. Um, I guess many of you read an article by Brett Scott a couple of months ago, uh, and he was talking about tokens being not money, but counter trade objects. Uh, and that's the first thing I want to say. Um, if you if you swap an apple for a banana, is the banana money to buy the apple or is the apple money to buy the banana? Um, I won't invite your comments on that. Uh, the point is that uh, both of the, uh, that in that exchange of commodities, neither of them had a special status as money. And it's much the same with tokens. Uh, it's a commodity to be sure, but why do you give it a special status when you swap it for something? Uh, and indeed, what is it that gives money that special status that when we swap money for a commodity, we say that we have bought it or sold it and not swapped it? Uh, and the answer is because money has this sociological, economic, legal status. It's recognized by all of us. Um, including the government. And I want to talk about the functions of money and why money does these things that tokens just cannot do as well. So first of all, the medium of exchange, I think of that as the, the most important function of money because it's the hardest one to replicate. A medium of exchange is something that um, when you want to swap the apple for the orange, and you can't do it directly because you're in the same room at the same time, you use this financial instrument to remember that the apple has been given and the orange has not. And the financial instrument only exists until the orange is given and then it's no longer needed. And so the financial instrument, which disappears, has facilitated the exchange. It existed only for that exchange. And it, it therefore existed temporarily while the exchange was incomplete. 
It came into being when the uh, when one half of the exchange happened, and it disappeared out of being when the other half of exchange happened. And that's what I understand as a medium of exchange. And if you take a lump of gold or a coin or something, and you call that a medium of exchange, it's um, it's not really facilitating any single exchange, and it never facilitates a complete exchange because it came into existence at the beginning uh, before the, any of the exchanges. And if it goes out of existence ever, it's independently of any of those exchanges. Am I making myself reasonably clear about that? Any permanent object cannot be a medium of exchange. I think, uh... I have a, a, a lot of objections, but I'd like to say it at the end. Okay. Um, I, I will add one caveat to that, which is that if, I, uh, uh, if you imagine a big chain of exchange with goods moving in one direction and the money moving in the other direction, each person along that change, chain is using the coin as a medium of exchange. But the problem is the exchange is never closed or complete uh, while the coin um, was put into existence by somebody who isn't exchanging and taken out of existence by somebody who isn't exchanging. Um, and that's why tokens make a very difficult medium of exchange. They kind of bias the whole process in the favor of the token issuer. Moving on to the store of value. Um, you have a need in the economy sometimes to, um, to delay the completion of the exchange. So you sell something, you get the medium of exchange, but you don't want to spend it right away. You might want to leave it for many years if you're saving up for something. And that's where you want something that isn't so much optimized for exchange, but something that's going to hold its value over time. Uh, when we say value, I mean purchasing power, something that will give you in X years time, the same amount of goods on the marketplace as you gave to the marketplace originally. And so the point of a store of value is that it holds its value over time, not even that it increases its value over time. That's a different function altogether. Um, that's more to do with investment and risk. And money isn't about that. Uh, you use shares and other financial instruments for investment and risk. So when money is a store of value, that means it's supposed to say, stay the same value over time. Uh, and the same goes for a medium of exchange as well. If you delay your exchange by any period of time, you want it to be worth the same when you bring it back to the marketplace. Um, and this idea of... Um, it matters what it's worth and it shouldn't fluctuate all the time is in the standard of value. Now, the standard of value means it's the dollar, the euro, um, the pound. It's the unit that we use to value everything so that we can exchange them in the marketplace. So if I say my labor is worth 20 euros an hour and your labor is worth 30 euros an hour, we can exchange um, three of my hours for two of your hours by doing this division, by calculating the ratio in pounds. And when we say that the pound is the standard of value, we mean that we use that to calculate the ratio. Um, the unit of account is slightly different. I might be using these terms slightly specially. Uh, and if you measure, if, if an account is a measure of debt of what somebody owes each other, then over time, you want to make sure that the value of the debt stays the same. So that's the fourth function of money. And the trouble is that when tokens are constantly fluctuating in value, because they have nothing against which they can value themselves, they completely fail to serve these principal functions of money. So for me, it's not helpful at all to think about tokens 
as money in the way that Bitcoin was originally hyped. Um, and I confess, even at the beginning of Bitcoin, I was thinking, my goodness, this could be a new money because I hadn't got a lot of these ideas sorted out by then. So about uh, uh, monetary theory is divided into two big areas. And one says that money is a commodity. And the other says that money is a, it's like a record of debt uh, or a credit. And the trouble is that when you are on the commodity side of the money equation, it cannot be stable in value. You always have to use artificial means or force or law or something in order to stabilize the value of your commodity, because every commodity has a price in the marketplace and the supply and the demand goes up and down. And that makes any commodity very difficult to use as a good money. Next slide, please. So I'm changing the subject a bit. Um, I listened to one of the early talks in this series. I think it was before the, the course started. And there was a discussion, maybe you can clarify, Angela, about uh, what should we use in the Token Engineering Academy? What kind of um, devices for rewarding people? Is that what it was? When was it? Uh, several weeks ago. It was the first thing you sent me. May have been the panel. Oh. Not sure if okay. I remember. It doesn't matter. There are several people contributing. Mm -hmm. And to me, the whole discussion seemed rather confused because all these ideas were mixed up. So I just want to pick some of these ideas apart for going forward. Uh, first of all, um, the scarcity versus the abundance of tokens. Um, when you have scarce tokens, there's the idea that they might have a, a financial value. Um, whereas if you have abundant tokens, you think that they have no financial value. Economics uh, basically teaches that uh, in order to be valuable, something has to be scarce. And that might be true in the marketplace context, um, but you can value things as well, which are totally abundant, like the air that you breathe and the water that you drink. Uh, also in... Um, in systems like in time banking, they don't have issuance policies that restrict the issuance of the hours in a time bank. The hours are valued because of what they mean, not because they're scarce on a marketplace. Uh, secondly, do the rewards translate to money or to governance or both? There were some assumptions in that discussion that since the rewards were tokens, and tokens are always tradable on a market, then rewards translate into money, but they might also give you a vote. Um, there's a similar debate in normal economics where uh, you have different kinds of shares. You have normal shares and uh, voting shares. And even uh, I read in Facebook, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has his own category of shares. That means that he can sell lots and lots of shares and have less than 50%, but he still retains control. And so uh, what's happening there is that the financial instruments are being designed ad hoc by lawyers to meet the needs of the people who are demanding them. And we can be very flexible about what it is that you can do with a token. Um, maybe you can't be flexible about whether a token trades on a marketplace because these things are all very, very open these days. But uh, whether a token gives you governance rights or whether it means that you contributed an hour or whether it gives you a claim on something in the organization um, like uh, a dividend is completely flexible and you can design that. Uh, finally, I want to point out that um, sometimes tokens or anything in the organization only has a meaning inside the organization. And it doesn't have to be universally visible or universally understood. 
So you could have a system, for example, whereby you reward everybody with a green frog uh, to acknowledge a brilliant idea. And nobody outside the organization would know what a green frog meant. But that doesn't mean that the green frog is worthless. So you have a, a frame of reference that's internal to the organization and then a more universal frame of reference, which you could call the market. Or there are attempts to make uh, globally recognizable reward systems. But that doesn't mean that the locally recognizable reward systems are not worth anything. Um, so do just value things that exist only inside the organization. Next slide, please. So some of the tokens, some, some of the uses to which tokens have been put, uh, they're very numerous. And I wonder if um, they're always the best tool for those things. So you can see that list there, voting, ownership, settling debt, media exchange, keeping count. Is a token the best thing for all of those? Well, I wonder. Voting. Uh, in order to, to have a good voting system, you need either an identity system so that you know that everyone has one vote or you need to you need people to give away their tokens uh, and it seems a funny thing to give somebody a token with which they can vote and then they just give it away and then what do you do with the tokens once they've been collected in the pool they they become redundant it just doesn't feel very tidy to me so what I'm saying is you can use tokens for voting and there are actually lots of different mechanisms that they'll support, but are they really ideal? Same with ownership. You can own a token, you can own an NFT in the sense that you hold the private key and only you can uh, transfer it into another wallet. But there's actually very few classes of things for which that kind of ownership is really meaningful. Um, ownership for most of us in most of the world involves actually possessing something real and having rights over it. And just owning tokens doesn't give you that ownership because the legal system isn't there backing up that claim. Um, so again, you can use tokens for ownership, but look at what they're doing in the rest of the world they're using things like uh, certificates, like you, uh, the land registry. You don't even possess the certificate on the land registry. It's, it's centrally managed. And that's how everyone knows that you own the land. Um, what else can you own? Uh, you can own an iPhone, but it doesn't matter what it says on the blockchain because with an iPhone, basically uh, property is theft, isn't it? If you own it, you own it. I mean, if you have it, you may as well own it. Can you uh, settle debt with tokens? Well, this comes back to what I said before uh, that Brett Scott said, you can use a token as a valuable object and give it to somebody in compensation for somebody. Um, but then there is no universal agreement about what that token is worth. There's a kind of market agreement. There's a price at that moment. Um, but debt is a, a socially acknowledged thing. And uh, just because the blockchain says so, it doesn't mean that everyone will agree. So that, that debt in the anthropological sense, that it's the business of the whole community who owes who, it's a bit harder to settle debt with uh, just tokens that somebody says is valuable. Uh, I already criticized uh, the medium of exchange. And when it comes to keeping count, well, that's the thing that I think tokens are really best at. Um, it's a kind of uh, context-free mathematical function and tokens are really ideal for keeping count um, without all the, the law and uh, everything else. So the danger is that because this whole space started with Bitcoin, it started with the issuance of tokens, we have um, grown out of that and we've kept a lot of the same assumptions. And now it seems to me that we're trying to do lots and lots of different things with the one tool that we have in the box, which is tokens. 
And I wish that um, the thinking was broader in this respect. Uh, even just thinking about using scripts and not token allocation, we can do so much more. Um, and I think that uh, the NFTs, uh, that since they constitute a different kind of token, they also open up some new possibilities. Next slide, please. Uh, Matthew, when you say scripts, could you explain a bit more what you mean by that? I, I meant Ethereum smart contracts. The, the, those okay. are scripts that look at oracles and then allocate tokens accordingly. Got it. Because, because all, you you can really, all you could do on a blockchain is own tokens and reallocate tokens. Got it. And you don't see that being used as much as you would like. Um, I think um, more imagination could be used. Could you share an example? I, I'm just curious kind of what you're thinking. Uh, well, my first example was NFTs. <clears throat> With an NFT, uh, you can give each NFT a different social significance. So it's not just a quantity of something that gives you uh, a power in a certain realm. I'm being vague on time. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to wrap my head like. If I, you think back think, to the real yeah, world rewards that we discussed earlier yeah. uh, and the motivation systems, um, you have to kind of squeeze those into token boxes in order to make them work in a tokenomics paradigm. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if, um, if we could be more imaginative uh, within the DAOs and, and not so strictly confined to doing everything on the blockchain and counting tokens. Ah, okay, got it. Like, I mean, from my perspective, I think we're actually doing a lot of that stuff um, in in decentralized communities where the NFTs represent a uh, well. I think for some, their status; for others, it's mission values. Uh -huh. um, where, Is that a, where, a widely discussed yeah. subject here, or should we make time for it at the end? Sure. Yeah, at the end is fine. Okay, next slide. I'm just saying, I think that's the way to go because there's only so much you can do with tokens. So I was thinking through a lot of these issues with Angela and she said, that should be a thing. We're gonna call it the Matt's Lats Framework for Designing Reward Systems. So I've copyrighted it and I will forget about it after this lecture, although you will be free to remember it. Um, so, a uh, series of simple questions, we're going to work through them in the remaining time. It's simply a matter of asking, what is being given to the DAO? What can the DAO give back? And then how do you knit those things together into a reward system? So, with that in mind, we can get straight on to brainstorm two. Uh, we just need to work out how we're going to do this in the groups, because I originally thought we would be doing it in our teams, where each team would be looking at a different use case. Uh, but maybe you can do that in ad hoc groups, thinking about your own use case, but still talking and listening to the others. Shall I copy and paste this into the chat again? Yeah, this would be great. Um... So everyone will open up breakout rooms again and feel free to either join the previous group or create a new one. Maybe it's good to have tinier groups with two or three maximum. And then um, go over brainstorm number two and you might want to continue with three and four in the same group. But for now, concentrate on brainstorm number two for, yeah, I think. And maybe try and stay with your teammates if you can, yeah. if they're here. And Patti will open up the breakout rooms again, I think now. Ah, everyone. Hello, I think everyone was assigned when I 
open the rooms. I'm sorry, I catch yeah, you. Yeah, you are, always you are... have to double check. The yeah. automatically assign uh, or manually assign. But yeah. for now, let's just leave it as is and people hopefully will find their yeah. way. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas, Andy and Abiodun, do you need help finding in your group? You could find, you could uh, work on a new group, I think, as you were in here before. I'm happy to work here as a new group. I'm happy mm -hmm. to find a room. Um, that's okay, join. we can just stay here. Or okay. should we? So for if you if you um, want to, let's just stay here and discuss the question. So um, I don't know how um, much of the of um, Matthew's talk you have been able to follow, but the question is how does the DAO need? What does the DAO need? And how can each type of contribution be measured? Quantity or quality, effort or achievement? Can you measure responsibility, consistency, anything else? So the fundamental question is, what does a DAO need and how to measure the contribution? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean- Throw your we, thoughts. Okay. Yeah. Do we apply this to a specific uh, use case um, or is it just a general? You can, if it helps. Oof, oof, okay. Um, what does a DAO need? I mean, active contribution for sure. Uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting idea. Um, I don't know, yeah, like, Hi, Patty. Um, so we are, what does the DAO need and which type of contribution be measured? Like I put in onboarding of new members, creating work streams. Um, what else do they need? I mean, it depends on the DAO, I would say. Maybe on... um, what does the DAO need and how uh, the quality effort achievement I mean, first of all, I just thought about capital and labor. I'll, I'll, it, mine's loading. So one is, you know, you're measuring capital and labor. And um, are you, does the token represent the labor that is a claim on the capital? Because you have a treasury and you're, you're, you're having la labor. And so sometimes I just think about in a simple term, it's a claim from labor onto the um, capital. And the capital is supposed to grow from the contribution labor makes. That's sort of the efficient model of the collective DAO because the, the labor stays in the capital, the value of the DAO. If the labor sucks, then you don't have much value at the end of the day. You drain the capital and you got nothing. There's probably a lot of DAOs that are going to end up like this. But um, the, the value, it's like the transfer of the value of labor to the collective, the taking of the capital or reward from the collective in exchange for the value that the labor has created. And I don't know why the link you put me, you put in the chat keeps opening up to the main. Uh... Uh, it's the main, it's the main. I just created here another, another frame on the main. Oh, you just created another frame. Oh, I gotta find it. Okay, where is it? Hold on, maybe. Um, I think you can look for me or just go on uh, Windows, not too uh, much. Yeah. Uh, on the top, on the top left. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Right, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I see right. you on the top right. I gotta find, I gotta get to you. That's why I kept skipping that. Okay. Anyway, um, as I'm doing that, it's just taking longer than it should. Um, yeah, I think it depends also really on the DAO. Huh? I mean, what they need, community manager. Maybe put this. It's like the guys who are organizing everything, doing like the onboardings, creating work streams. It's different quality measurement systems. It's something in between here. On the value now or maybe later, it's for me, is it compensation? Is it a bonus? Is it a stock option? 
Because if it's speculative, it's more of an option. If it's a uh, now, it's a compensation. It's clean. It's tr the transaction's over. The value is mm -hmm. set. And if it's um, what was I saying? A bonus. It's a uh, conditioned on some trigger happening in the system. Sorry for jumping in late. I was in a big group and realized I be maybe a uh, more interesting a smaller one. So and since Mark and I chat a lot, decided yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, join this you. one. I wrote you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to see you. <laughs> we'll, chat, we'll chat later, actually. Um, <laughs> There's Mark. Mark, should I have you? Oh, uh, there you are. Yeah, yeah. I finally You're found somewhere it. all the way down on the view. Just go all the way up. I yeah. mean, you can all see it here in the little map. We yeah. are all the way up. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. You know, on that, if, if I can just comment quickly and jump in here, you know, on this first question, what does the DAO need, right? I think that's kind of like the, the core question that when Mark and I were looking at the, the TEC praise one is, you know, the, the, the DAO's need is, is based on the mission or the vision for the DAO. So it, I think, you know, to look there first um, was always, you know, helpful to, you know, think about what is the real mission alignment um, and then think about what would be measured. Yes, you can, maybe you can sum it up in goals or on yeah. mission and start from there. And then create like kind of working streams and mm -hmm. uh, KPIs kind of thing. Do DAOs have KPIs? They should. They should. <laughs> if the community decides, you see their yeah. their their yeah. um, because the governance. Well, I was gonna say, you know. Um, measured by voting well it's the established governance structure because like he was talking about law corporations are set up in law there's a strict corporate governance that has to be respected it doesn't mean that like one one corporation can't just decide to ignore corporate form like they just can't say like well we don't care about the shareholders i mean there's a system it's it's a it's a it's a fixed system in the law a gambiha has a certain legal structure and there's a certain governance structure that's in it uh axion gesellschaft has the same thing i'm using the german one it doesn't matter but you know these all have fixed rules the thing about DAOs is there aren't fixed rules they're not there's no there's no fixed structure that says every DAO has to have one, two, three. That's what makes it very flexible, but also um, so chaotic. flexible that we might, you might, it's undefined and therefore undefinable. All, all you know, it has, there's very basic characteristics of a, of a shared treasury. Um, I mean, you can have a one person DAO, you know. <laughs> one person DAO. Just like you can have a one-person corporation, quite honestly, and the, the corporation basically does the, the, the function of the president, the treasurer, and the secretary. Like there's three main functions to a corporation, and you can have one person acting acting all of those roles. I'm not saying this, you know, that's possible. Um, it looks a little scammy sometimes, but it's legally possible. Um, Yes. Angela. Okay, let's share briefly um, what okay. you've found or collected in your group, just briefly. Just a, a couple of sentences per, per team. And uh, I'd just like to call up Walter. What were your results? What does a DAO need and how to measure this?
Walter, can you hear me? Me? I think what Livia uh, taught us is that we need less transactions and more human relations, that we need that kind of a loving thing going, and tokens or money get in the way of that, and they get in the way of it equally. It's counting is bad for loving. Okay. That's not exactly what I said, but I, yeah. <laughs> Libby, just, Libby, just yeah. trying. You should have the chance to add uh, one more thought, Jess. Yeah, if you don't think it's appropriate or not 100%. No, I think there was a feeling in the group that people wanted to share a little bit about uh, the conversations that were happening first. So mm -hmm. um, it was hard to jump immediately into mm -hmm. the exercise. Mm -hmm. And there was varied opinions about, um, I don't know, feeling some resistance over this view of money, this different mm -hmm. of, of money and tokens. And mm -hmm. um, I was just adding that I think like measuring like quality and responsibility, consistency, things like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they come from uh, not so transactional nature of human relations. Mm -hmm. They're more subjective mm -hmm. and that are harder to tokenize or quantify, but I think it's it's possible if we, I don't know, our, this is part of what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. also. Yeah. On a side note, I realized that there are some, uh, I think, controversies on uh, what Matthew just discussed in the last couple of slides. We can use the, and I would be keen to discuss it actually, um, we can use the um, session starting at five, I guess, to take some time for, for this conversation. So I don't want to, uh, yeah, or right the other way around. Um, I'd like to have room for this. Well, All I right. join you for that. Yeah, please do, at five. So in three hours from now. But for now, let's continue with the brainstorming. Um, Sean. The next slide is just one question. I'm gonna paste it in the chat to everybody. Uh, Matthew, should, should we go right ahead with the next brainstorming? Yeah. I, oh, okay, good. Sorry, fine. So Let's what go. do contributors need, want, or hope for from their involvement? Okay, so this is just next brainstorming. Um, party, if people can manually join their groups, they can gather in the same group, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, what, the rooms are open again. And you can choose your room, everyone, and please join the same people, ideally, to can, continue the conversation. And the question now is, what do contributors need? Not the DAO, but the contributors want or hope for. We don't have to take this too seriously. We're just kind of rehearsing the process here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm getting into a debate with Jose. Yeah. He said uh, decentralized finance is better than normal finance in every possible way. Let's go. <laughs> it seems like an absolute that should be easy to knock down. <laughs> Carson and Andy, do you need help? I just returned getting a coffee. Yes, I need help. Okay. Uh, do you remember what group you were, what room Break you were at? Uh, I see the breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. check. Okay. This one looks good. Uh, I'm so Angela, these sessions were originally 20 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. the breakouts mm -hmm. um, but since everybody's not
Yeah, because I think it's there are two types of I think kind of DAOs. Maybe there's some overlap. There's ones that have quite a, a a mission that goes beyond just sort of like increasing total value locked or you know boosting yields in a vault or something to actually you know build in some sort of new community or a new field. And I think uh, people want to you know be able to somehow have that creative outlet to build something that's never been built before. There's probably on the other end of that spectrum, more kind of like the DeFi DGen DAOs that are really just about like building the next financial instrument to like move the needle on whatever the, the financial metric they care about is. Um, but again, maybe there's some mission to that because they are thinking, oh, we're disrupting the banks. We're doing this mission to, you know, reinvent economics. Um, and maybe it's more just more financial stuff rather than uh, the, the kind of mission base. But at some point, maybe everyone still has their own personal mission. Yeah, you can't make a you can't make a one size fits all. I think when they try to monetize it, you're always appealing to just value money as it's as it's currently understood, which is doesn't appeal to everyone because some people want the like the currency of cool is is can't be monetized right if you're the only one that can get into that amazing club or um whatever or you know at a religious organization you're considered the high elder um of that that only is relevant in that community i mean uh i always think about i don't know if you ever seen tiger king you know with, sure. yeah so like you know i mean she um you know carol baskin had a whole system of t-shirts you know for the volunteers who would clean shit in a tiger cage and spend their spend their Christmas, um, do, which to me sounds like the worst way I would ever spend my time. But they would just wanted to get the yellow T-shirt and then they would get the green T-shirt if they did it for years and years and they would get up to the I don't know whatever. And they, then they'd be eaten by a tiger. So I mean that was that was the Dow hierarchy. That was the NFTs that you would get in that you know Carol Baskin's uh, tiger uh, you know cage cleaning uh, Dow basically. So. It really is subjective, that's, is my point. Uh, that's status, and maybe a higher yeah. maybe or status. I don't know. Status, yeah. No. Recognition within the group. Yeah, and then I think probably like shared upside a bit because you you want to contribute towards something that will um, not be totally worthless, right? You want to sort of be a co-owner and shared prosperity, basically, that you're all working towards. Investment. Mm -hmm. That you're like, your labor gets multiplied in the future. It's like a deferred mm -hmm. benefit. That's about it. that question and then there's this one about maybe access which is slightly different version of status yeah, um, I, because you're with an exclusive group yeah i mean like access to you know some circle of people mm -hmm. mainly yeah to talk to Cheers. Cool. Yeah. And then, and then something around, you know, like impact, right? I think people are, are thinking which DAO can I actually work with that generates some, you know, benefit in the real world, which is one than one that's just, you know, ineffective. So kind of like legacy. Yeah, f effective like impact, kind of probably what you think about in your day job, Mark. Like the efficiency of getting to a, like a good outcome, a and people want um, probably that ability to you know uh, make an impact effectively. Yeah, we measure. I mean, actually, I was putting in our our hack MD on the uh, how we met how the system currently is set up to measure impact and how you could do a data driven ap approach to that, right? Because it has to be measurable. In my view, it's a measurable impact. 
or it's a like Libby's point, it's a qualitative impact, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, because I, I, I see the qualitative aspects often in this, like, you know, there were so many times in the, you made me smile. It's an impact, but I mean, you can measure how many smiles. You could say, how many smiles did I create? But I mean, that's a, that's a quantitative approach, but I mean, the, the qualitative approach was like, you created a sensation in me. Because maybe I got the mm -hmm. same sensation, but I didn't smile. I don't know. Bad indicator. I'm not saying we should do this. I'm just... <laughs> That's cool. Last point I put is like knowledge and networking, maybe. This is the drama of our working sessions. I mean, we scheduled it for two hours. It's already, if, if you try to make room in your calendar, I guess, it's already pretty long, but then yeah. for the discussion is always too short. But keep in mind, this should be an inspiration. So the whole January and February is reserved for come up with new reward systems. And maybe this framework helps you structuring your conversation and your work. So it's totally okay uh if you just yeah get the hang of it or or start to think about it okay but uh feel free to share um any interesting result here andy would you like to share anything from your conversation in your room andy can you hear me okay um then let me choose Sean, since I interrupted you. Okay, no yeah, so uh, we had a great conversation. I was kind of listening in. Uh, Sid was going, referencing the framework Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs and uh, really elegantly described how the sort of typical DAO experience, which is of the higher um needs and I, and I maybe Sid can touch on this but uh really starting and I don't have the hierarchy in front of me so I don't <laughs> know opponents but many people join the DAO space already having their basic needs fulfilled and mm -hmm. it's even somewhat of an assumption mm -hmm. um, in the DAO space that people have time to give um and they're looking for things like education mm -hmm. and higher growth and these kinds of things. Uh, and then Sid actually mentioned there are a few DAOs specifically for the lower needs, uh, if basic needs aren't met. met. Mm -hmm. There's a Padawan DAO, which I've never heard of, Sid was mentioning, that is actually made for students to be able to get sponsored and get um, paid to do education and go to conferences and things like that. Super interesting. Mm -hmm. And Sid was saying uh, the highest um, aspect of the hierarchy is um, self-actualization and transcendence, which maybe no one has <laughs> quite yet reached in the DAO space, uh, to quote Sid. So really interesting conversations. Uh, I was just kind of listening in, but that's the recap. They haven't reached it because you can't tokenize it. Nah, Matthew. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks for sharing, Sean. And... Now let's go straight to the next brainstorming round since we only have 50 minutes left. So what's the next question? Matthew? Next question, I'm pasting it in now. Uh -huh. With what things or contingent things can the DAO reward or incentivize contributors? Uh, when I say contingent things, I mean things that might exist in the future, like the future value of the DAO. Uh, like dividends and things like that, uh, because they can be rewards. But bear in mind that a token is not a thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go. Please go back to the brainstorming rooms. Please find your team again and try to come up with some things or contingent things the DAO can reward contributors. I'm hoping this question will yield some more interesting answers.
because it's very difficult because DAOs generally consist of people who are far apart and who don't know each other very well. And what can they really give to each other apart from the financial fruits of their labor? Do you need assistance? I think I just want to dive in to uh, find Walter and answer him. He's in room three. Thank you. I'm going to disrupt. Okay, I'm going to... Send you some messages, Andy. If you need me, please let me know. Workers in the. Mm -hmm. That's true. Unless you have incentivized contributors. Model, you're right. You're right. The German model has put some of the you know the labor unions. I didn't see that difference there. Yeah. In the two tier, the, the German model has the two tiered board, right? So labor mm -hmm. sits on the on the on the one board. So it's a slightly different model, but. Um, okay. No, but that's good. I guess in every DAO, you know, every contributor is going to be like a partial owner, but the, there um, might definitely wouldn't be like that many whale contributors, right? The contributors might be more trying to move up um, and we need to make sure contributions uh, recognized probably even more so than just capital. So yeah, this is important, I think distinction you mentioned here. Um, you know, more and more, I, I think of some of the, the access stuff is, you know, in the music industry or in some of the more like cultural DAO settings where different NFTs give you to like part of the, the, the sort of club benefits outside of the digital world and in real life access to, to, to parties or services or you know, you get a, your favorite artist's um, CD or MP3, um, you know, a month before everyone else does. So um, all, all these kind of cool access features that could come with, uh, I guess it would be, those rights would be baked into an NFT somehow, but if we want to keep it on chain, but I guess we don't have to be constrained by that. Yeah, NFT is not a token, right? I mean, yeah, okay. That's the fun thing about saying like anything but tokens. I mean, tokens exercise rights, so <laughs> they can be anything. Anything can be a token. Right? Um, what they can give back. I mean, what does a company give back except for money? I mean, maybe social contracts. Um, um, well, job titles is what a lot of people care about. Uh, Status, that's then status. Yeah. Um, I mean, also like the networking opportunity, or like that you can make new friends. Um, yeah, because like I was thinking again on this labor capital distinction, like the DeFi protocols tend to come up with reward systems for capital, right? They'll yeah. give you extra tokens for your capital. They'll give you APYs for your capital. They're basically because they're because they need capital. That's all they live on. Whereas the, like the token engineering commons or some of these that are trying to be um, worker collectives, they need to think on how they're attracting the best talent um, mm -hmm. that will then put the value into the, uh, 
into the collective. So it, it really does ultimately depend on what your what the organizational need is. True. I, I like the point that Philip made right before we dropped off about knowledge, right? Where it'd be, you know, in, in at least in crypto and stuff, everyone cares about like alpha knowledge and stuff. So if there's ways to, you know, get plugged into um, the la creme de la creme of, of, you know, new knowledge is always uh, quite cool or, or valuable for a contributor. Going first before the market, then buying in first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Great We're just being able yeah, to speak to the biggest brains, right? That, that matters. Yeah, because it's like, that's a great question. How do you measure? Because first... Back in the room, Matthew. Let's Final hear it for the most interesting results. Who hasn't shared a result yet? Mark. Mark Mini. Me? Oh, you're talking to me. Okay, so <laughs> we had a we had a really good discussion on um, uh, a lot of things from knowledge, but I, I just wanted to focus on some of the points I was raising on the distinction between labor and capital. Mm -hmm. And really just because it gets into the, the question of dividends, which is of course uh, a reward for capital and bonuses, which is a reward for uh, labor in an organization. And it depends on what the organization needs are in retaining and rewarding and incentivizing. And on the corporate structure, of course, the shareholders own the, own the corporations and make the decision to reward capital. Slight wrinkle to that is the German model, which has a two-tiered board, which allows for some input to capital. You can think of that as a hybrid model for large corporations. And, um, but the bonuses is, is pretty standard across the structure where you're, so if, you're, if your DAO is a DeFi protocol, you tend to focus on how do you reward capital and you look at capital type of rewards. Whereas in um, labor, like token engineering commons or, these worker collectives where you're trying to incentivize the best talents to bring value into the organization and that labor is converted into a value that then is retained by the organization. Then you need to think around what are the intrinsic incentives for labor, um, including deferred uh, you know, uh, rewards, access, recognition, and you know, um, sort of uh, a myriad of knowledge. Then I think Philip and some other colleagues were raising knowledge and sort of again these sort of um hard to quantify aspects but also are highly valuable they add value so we were trying to then discuss how we could measure those yes that was that was the main discussion maybe the other colleagues mm -hmm. yeah um i i could add on the topic also go to the menu go ahead rodolfo no, sorry. Something oh. started playing accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I, I would add to the, the knowledge topic. We uh, discussed the TE Academy and how there's the perks of fr free education or being able to participate in things like this once you're an alumni of the Academy. Um, wow. And that is extremely valuable to people. Makes me think you could send your people to conferences. Instead of rewarding with a token, you mean? Well, as a reward, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's continue with the final brainstorming, right? Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Um, the final brainstorm is how to knit it all together. And you can do it in a complicated way or a simple way, or maybe something in between. Uh, to knit things together in a complicated way gives you a lot of texture and it, it, you can build an interesting system maybe something more like a, a game system but of course things can be over complicated and put people off and be expensive to manage on the other hand sometimes uh, a system that's too simple is flat and uninteresting and it will favor some people over other people i mean it will incentivize some people for some tasks more than other people. So you, when you're thinking about uh, how simple and how complicated, you might think about having a series of simple mechanisms. 
whether you reward uh, different tasks in different ways, or whether you allow people maybe to choose their rewards, or whether you have kind of overlapping systems where you might reward effort and achievement at the same time for, for two separate tasks. Um, so this was intended to be the longest uh, brainstorm, but that won't be the case. But uh, do go away and meditate for five minutes on uh, how you might knit together some of the ideas that you've come across before and try to, uh, as I say, get away from simply giving people tokens for measurable tasks. Uh, think about NFTs and think about other ways that you might quantify and reward. And maybe Break out I groups, please. Yeah, no groups. So just think for okay. yourself quietly and try to come up based on what you've discussed in the groups quietly for five minutes. Try to come up with a mechanism based on your conversations in the previous a mechanism that right. nobody else in the group will have thought of an original mechanism all right okay so think for yourself we'll have five minutes so you have some background music and then we share i don't know peter <laughs> it is our man. never short of i'm my music is just going to make everyone want to dance not brainstorm Might help. <laughs> All right, I'll put some Enya. Another track.
Well, that was possibly too quick, but let's leave a okay, few minutes at the we end. We are on top of the hour. Shall we come together again for sharing some first mechanisms you have drafted? I'm wondering if people and might just share original ideas. Justin, do you have any results? First ideas? Yeah, I think. Uh... It's hard to show a you full. You might be muted. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, my mistake. <laughs> it's okay. Um, for me, it's hard to I think show a full tapestry. Um, I was just thinking of some of the things that contributors were value. Um, is this idea of maybe like reputation or consistency, where um, maybe they have a um, more of a ability to vote or steer based on their length of contribution in a DAO. So um, kind of longstanding loyalty mm -hmm. um, will be rewarded um, maybe through some sort of uh, creative NFT sort of voting function. But I think to be able to, to steer uh, your baby, so to say, if you were kind of there from the beginning would be um, potentially something that would help contributors, um, you know, stay with it if, if their loyalty is always sort of rewarded somehow. Okay. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, who else? Now Mark. Mark Mini. To the other Mark. Yeah, yes, the here we Mark. go. <laughs> the real Mark. <laughs> well, oh. um, <laughs> I was thinking about um, um, having some metric about whoever um, makes the most connections within a DAO by sharing stuff or by working together with people is the uh, the high performer in the DAO, and he should reward it. He should be rewarded for that. So not money wise, but by means of connections or connections to be laid. Um, this is also how we measure the health of a DAO. Okay. But, um, I think, yeah. So discover the high performers and put some metrics on it, which is not about achievements, but more about connections. Okay. I'm sure you guys have a lot of comments. Maybe we can come back to, uh, to this mechanism uh, at five. I'd like to first hear two or three more. Henrik. Sorry, I, I was multitasking. So please find someone else. Okay, Philip. Yeah, I think that's kind of a difficult uh, thing to like just explain and come up in five minutes. But... Sure. Like we know. a system or like a mechanism I think would be really compelling is if the contributors need to put in stake beforehand um, so kind of they would mint or issue kind of 
an IOU in order that they also didn't come like that they complete the task they are offering to complete. And then it could be matched with some contributions by other partners and team. And then it's kind of loose and ending in kind of retrospective funding. And maybe you get like an identity based on how many and would be again with tokens how many tokens you issued and how many you actually got back because you were like delivered and maybe you also over delivered so you got back more tokens than you issued so you'd have kind of like a, a balance of like how many times you said you're going to do something and then how much mm -hmm. you got back um, or even more because people said like oh that was amazing work that's even more worth than you asked for mm -hmm. I mean, that's interesting yeah okay cool rough I mean not too bad for five minutes, I'd say. Thanks. And uh, maybe finally, Torsten. Oops, oh, I'm still thinking. So no problem. The, the first thing that came to mind um, as a reward was uh, love, but I think that this might be too simple. So I went to talk to my wife and asked her exactly the question. But we, we, we did not came up with a, with the answer that that I can share with you. All right. Thanks. Anyway, Sitco dropped a couple. Sitco, do you want to? Are you still in the call? Uh, no. Yeah, I'm had, still here. Oh yes, you're here. Uh, do you want to briefly go over it? Yeah, it's just one combined uh, reward system um, based on contributing to both the growth and efficiency needs of any individual contributor. So um, the reward is split into all four aspects of society that I covered earlier. That is, some uh, contributors need an economic reward that can be in the form of old money, like a stable coin or even fiat money, if that's their thing. Some can be compensated in economic rewards in the form of new uh, sort of tokens, which have an economic value in this new microeconomy. Uh, some in the form of NFTs, like POAPs, which um, offer some other kind of economic value to them. Then there is cultural value. Some people are more motivated by cultural rewards, like what is the mission, values, and vision of a community like in the case of the common stack and token engineering. And um, POAPs also play a big role here, and NFTs play a big role in culture. Then technological rewards, as Sean suggested, like all of us feel like we are on a rocket ship building something cool together in this coordinated mission. Uh, and that's a big revolutionary responsibility um, in building that kind of new technology. So that is a reward in itself. And finally, there's the policy rewards. Since it's a DAO, it's decentralized and autonomous. So that kind of uh, uh, nature of a DAO uh, is a reward for some in itself, like uh, how do we ensure decentralization of a DAO even when the DAO becomes too big? Uh, how do we ensure autonomy of small teams? So uh, rewards which are based on governance powers and voting rights and increased responsibilities, health insurance, all these would come under policy. So, so yeah, that's what we were discussing in the last uh, few breakout rooms. All right, thanks for sharing. So I think there are a lot of of dimensions we can take a look at and that you've discovered in this session only. And um, yeah, I think um, you are invited to come back to some of the aspects of, of this workshop at five. And um, again, this is a framework that should help you to um, create new mechanisms in phase three after the Christmas break. Uh, but thanks for the session today. Thanks for trying hard to come up with the brainstorming and with results in five minutes. And Matthew, let's close the session. Um, I'll spare you my concluding slide, but I would be very happy if at five o'clock, everyone could offer a sentence or two about what they most remember from this session. It doesn't have to be praise for me, but I'm just interested to know uh, the, the one or two things that you will uh, remember a week from now. All right. Some uh, logistics. Uh, there's now a break until um, 3.45. So um, 
35 minutes break wherever you are and then we'll meet again is it the same channel patty i think so um we will drop the zoom link again to the discord so no worries you'll find the zoom space and then we'll have a session with sargam on measuring and kpis all right thanks for now everyone and see you in 35 minutes and thanks see a lot Matthew. Everyone. thanks so much yeah, it's great. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Matthew. Sorry, Matthew. I was late. No worries. Up to you somehow. Thanks, Matthew. Super interesting. See you later. See you Bye -bye. later. See you later.